Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I am from France, however, I was born in Poland, which uh, might explain a lot of things because, you know, in Poland people are obsessed with history and they are interested in Russia, okay? Um, so I will tell you about a Cold War cryptography. I will tell you about Ghost, uh, which is actually a name in the West people give to a Russian encryption standard. Uh, I will tell you about how it was submitted to ISO um, uh, very recently, and then how Ghost can eventually be broken um, with a survey of a number of uh, distinct attacks. Uh, most of these attacks were developed by me, but not all. And um, the best of these attacks is um, to the power 101 currently. Uh, um, however, this attack requires a lot of data, so it's uh, uh, possible to claim it's um, almost practical or it's possible to claim that it can never be practical uh, regarding whether you, you uh, think it's um, interesting or not. <laughs> um, so let's start with the uh, um, history. So in the Cold War you had two superpowers, okay? And um, 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 you have uh, the problem of, uh, you know, uh, knowing what the other superpower is doing. Okay, so the cryptography um, was one of the protections of your communications, which was obviously crucial if your intentions needed not to be known to the enemy. Um, so I will also do a small advertisement. So at LinkedIn, these are two of my favorite groups, which actually I'm a, one of the founders of. So one is called Codebreakers. We have 300, more than 300 members, and I invite people uh, to join this group. Uh, however, I must tell you that we um, select members and we uh, re require people to have some proven expertise. So let's say at least uh, rele relevant pro professional experience or at least, uh, uh, let's say, an MSc thesis in a relevant topic at the university. Um, another group which is quite interesting as well, it's called Who Can Solve It? Um, so it's based on the idea is that um, there is a lot of interesting and hard problems out there which we do not really know that they are solvable by software today. And yet if you just try, just press the button, you realize that these problems are actually solvable by software. Okay, so I also invite you to join this group if you are interested in uh, um, uh, this, uh, this thing. It has a lot of applications in uh, formal software verification, finding bugs, finding exploits on software in an auto automated way, um, uh, solving various, um, uh, uh, let's say, financial or telecom optimization problems, uh, etc. Um, um, there is a lot of connections between these areas because each NP-hard problem can be reduced to another NP-hard problem. So if you develop very good software for solving just one NP-hard problem, like in code breaking, for example, uh, well, it's a sort of basic generic technology which, which has a lot of interesting applications elsewhere, and uh, including applications that you do not at all suspect that they would exist. Uh, so now I'm going to switch my Russian subtitles on, so code breakers, you have the Russian version. Okay, anybody from Russia? Yes, welcome. <laughs> yes. Um, so a little bit of history. So um, in the 19th century, uh, Russia was able to break the codes of all the major powers. However, when the revolution came, the Tsarist Secret Service, they basically continued to work for the white counter-revolutionary forces. So they have lost all the competent people. Uh, and the consequence of this was that um, uh, uh, in the, uh, before the, uh, 1920, almost all correspondence of the uh, Red Army and uh, Russian government was broken basically by many people like the White Armed Forces, the British, the Swedish and the Polish, most notably because they broke um, all the key messages they needed to basically win the war with Russia in 1920. However, they started breaking codes as well. So, for example, it's known that in 1930, a Russian codebreaker broke a US code. 
So also United States cryptography was extremely weak at the time. And the problem was is that um, the United States government decided that gentlemen don't read each other's uh, email and they, just, they have just fired all the cryptologists. <laughs> okay? Which is widely known due to this book. <laughs> okay? Um, so we go very quickly through history. Uh, around 1965, Russians have built their first very, very ser serious and sophisticated cipher machine, which was used until the, eight, eight, uh, the, the late 80s, which is called Fiauka. Um, so if you know a little bit about confidential government cryptography, you should understand that there will be many versions of such a machine that will be used, typically. So for example, each country of the Wars of Pact had their own version, it had different keyboard and different fonts, which was peanuts compared to the main issue, that it had different secret set of 10 wheels. And this was obviously a well-kept secret, what the uh, 10 um, wheels actually are. And the number of combinations of these wheels is actually absolutely outstanding, much higher than, um, than the, the key size of a typical uh, cipher in its initial setting. We also know a little bit about Cold War Soviet cryptanalysis. So we know that Soviet Union was breaking codes and employed at least 100 cryptologists. Uh, for example, in 1967, they have intercepting cryptograms from 115 countries using 152 crypto systems. And among those, uh, those they broke 11 codes. Was Fiauka broken? Well, it's widely said and confirmed by many sources that it was. Um, Israel have captured Fiauka machines uh, during their war with Egypt. Uh, Austria would intercept and decrypt a fair amount of uh, Fiauka traffic and the NSA would have built a, a supercomputer for routine breaking of Fiauka. Um, so there is a big analogy between these um, uh, rotor machines that we have known since ever and the modern uh, ciphers, especially in uh, high security applications. So the modern equivalent of the secret rotors in a machine, like in Fiauka, would be the S-boxes. And in exactly the same way, these S-boxes would be kept confidential, would be used only in one application, maybe by a few people. Actually, modern military ciphers, actually, they would have S-boxes that could be used just by a team of people just once and destroyed just minutes after. So uh, there are many versions of this. But these S-boxes, again, their entropy and, uh, um, is much higher than the entropy of the secret key. Uh, in the 30s, um, the, the Polish mathematician Rajewski, with the help of French um, uh, Secret Service, they have reverse engineered the uh, German Enigma machine. And the rotors were found by mathematics. And this was much harder than daily code breaking at Bletchley Park, because uh, once you know the rotors, the daily code breaking actually is uh, much easier number of combinations, it's much smaller. Um, if we look at the US ciphers, um, it's known that um, Russia broke the NATO K KL7 cipher machine, which was also used massively by the United States and the NSA. The NSA did not see it, uh, it was weak. The spec of the machine against the rotors mostly became no because of a spy ring by a certain John Walker and uh, friends and family. Uh, he was paid uh, for this more than $1 million by the NSA, and it's, uh, it's from uh, NSA uh, sources. To this day, this spec of this cipher is not known to the public, so nobody knows what the rotors actually are, even today. It's known uh, to be the greatest exploit in KGB history, and it allowed the Soviet Union to read millions of American messages and also of NATO messages over many years until this became known around 90, 1985. Okay. So Walker has obtained from KGB this amazing uh, pocket machine made of plastic and with electronic components in it. So this machine um, was foldable, he would unfold it, he would put the rotor basically here, then there was this little piece here that would come out, and you would connect this piece here, and then you would just go around with this uh, spring um, uh, connector, 
actually with this spring connector, and then it would connect you to all the, um, um, all the contacts here, and then from a uh, lamp display here, it was very, very small and tiny, you would read the connections of the rotor, and then copy them on paper and transmit to the, to, to the KG, KGB. Uh, on just one day, uh, this guy has received uh, a quarter of a million of dollars in payment. Okay, let's go to modern cryptanalysis now. So, um, algebraic cryptanalysis is a name given to a lot of different attacks nowadays, and half of them are not even very algebraic. Um, um, however, we don't have a better name. Um, so, um, Claude Shannon says that algebraic cryptanalysis is about solving a very complex system of mathematical equations, basically. 1949. Uh, so, what is the motivation for this type of attacks? Actually, most of the time, these attacks are slower than other known attacks on the same cipher. However, the big difference is that a lot of classical attacks, such as dif linear differential cryptanalysis, uh, usually require huge quantities of known or chosen plaintexts. So, it's safe to say that 99% of res ever, uh, research in cryptanalysis ever published never, have, never has any practical applications. It's total fiction, because the quantities of data required for these attacks are just impractical to, to gather, and actually they never exist, because for many of these attacks, um, um, actually the frequent rekeying of the ciphers in the industry applications prevent them from being feasible at all, even if you could collect the data. Um, so, uh, the motivation is then what kind of cryptanalysis is possible when the attacker has only one no plaintext or very few, and we call it low data cryptanalysis. It can be algebraic cryptanalysis, it can be uh, uh, many other um, techniques uh, like meet, meet in the middle attacks and uh, some other. Um, I can skip this one. So, uh, in algebraic cryptanalysis, you proceed by writing some mathematical equations and solving them. So, it's a key re recovery process through solving systems of equations. You have to typically to program and experiment a lot to make these things work. And a lot of at uh, attacks which are known are not explained and accounted uh, for by theory. So, we don't know why they work in many cases, and sometimes they work much better than we thought, and sometimes they, do, they don't work as well as we thought. Um, there is a web page on which I put some ready software for people who want to play with algebraic uh, cryptanalysis and also with such solver cryptanalysis. Uh, so, in 2007, we have published a paper for, in which we show um, an attack on six rounds of DES. So, it's not a big deal, okay, because DES has 16 rounds, okay. However, the unique feature of this attack is that it required only one known plaintext, which has never been achieved before. And then, basically, you can break DES. Uh, so, what about Ghost? Ghost is expected to be the Russian version of DS, okay? So, uh, yes, for Ghost we can break like up to uh, eight rounds of Ghost really, really easily by software. Okay? So, again, you may uh, laugh at it and say, okay, well, you can break eight rounds and the attacks actually they have very fastly growing exponential complexity. So, nine rounds is go already much harder than eight rounds. Okay? So, can we ever hope to break 32 rounds of Russian Ghost? Okay, and the answer is yes, you can, but you have to do something completely different. Um, so there is an additional thing which um, exists in many cipher, which is a self-similarity, high-level self-similarity. And this is basically what makes ciphers breakable in spite of them having many rounds. So the key idea is that you can reduce the complexity of a cipher somewhat. For example, reduce the number of rounds. Okay, so we use self-similarity. For example, one big block is equal to another big block. Okay, or another big block is maybe not equal, but maybe Q is actually a prefix of P in a functional way or something like this. Uh, so uh, we are looking for a sort of magical method to allow the attacker to guess and determine values inside the cipher. 
Okay, so we now call this process algebraic complexity reduction. It's a sort of umbrella name for many um, uh, attacks which uh, uh, maybe have uh, very, very few things in, in common, but they share this overall um, uh, um, idea. Uh, so, um, there is a lot of ciphers out there which have a lot of self-similarity. For example, my first classic cipher, which is called Crypto One, which was um, um, uh, debated and uh, studied a lot at this conference. Okay, so, um, so it's still used by hundreds of millions of people um, every day. Um, another cipher is Keylock, also used by millions of people to unlock their cars. Uh, so Keylock is actually the most expensive uh, cipher ever made because it was sold and it is documented for 10 million of dollars by the designer and kept confidential. Um, so Keylock has some interesting attacks which are called sliding attacks, which are, are one of the uh, simplest forms of similarity attacks. And um, we have published one of the advanced sliding attacks at FSC 2008 conference. So let me explain very briefly the idea, because it's also relevant to the Russian ghost. So um, in the classical sliding attack, you exploit the self-similarity in the following way. Uh, so you have some cipher encryption here, with a re this repeated pattern of 64 rounds in the case of Keylock. And then you align it in, in the following way, like, like on the picture, um, with another encryption in which this value here, which is the plain text here, is going to be equal, which happens sometimes, to this value inside the encryption. Okay? And then because everything inside is equal, you get that this value here is equal to another value here inside the encryption. Okay? And once you have realized that, it's very interesting because you get a, something which we call amplification. So you have, at the, at, the, at the beginning, the attacker has just one pair. So he knows that the encryption of PI is equal to PJ after 64 rounds. So this is like his assumption. So it's like you have a hat and you put a rabbit inside your hat because the attacker needs to know it from somewhere. Maybe he just guesses. Okay? And then, by this magic process of self-similarity, the attacker realizes that CI and C CJ are also related in the same way. So you get another pair, most of the time distinct, for the 64 rounds. So it's like you put one, one rabbit into your hat and you take out two rabbits out of your hat. Okay? That's the thing. And in the classical sliding attack, you can do it again. Because you can again start with the same pair here and apply it at the beginning and encrypt and you get yet another pair. And actually in a classical sliding attack, you get almost an unlimited number of pairs from just one. So you put one rabbit into your hat and you take out many, many, many more rabbits. Okay? So that's the, this is why sliding attacks are so powerful. Okay, now in Keylock we cannot really apply this attack. Because in Keylock you have additional 16 rounds here, which are uh, breaking this attack. So we cannot really uh, obtain the values here, we don't know what they are, okay, and we don't know what to do, okay. Um, so the, um, however, um, well, you can observe that these 16 rounds here are actually a prefix of this 60 round, 64 rounds here. So basically the value here is still a real value which occurs somewhere in the middle of this encryption. So you still get a relation, okay, but it's like you put one white rabbit and you get out a blue rabbit. It's a relation for almost a different cipher. And you cannot continue this process again. You cannot apply it again. So you just for one rabbit you get two rabbits and that's over. Game over. And this calls for a low data complexity attack. So can you do something with just two rabbits? Okay, you cannot hope to have three rabbits. Okay. And um, we basically do it, we apply an algebraic attack with a SAT solver, and basically we break keylog in this way. Okay, actually it takes two seconds to recover the key from this information. Okay, um, and it's, 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 it's feasible in practice. 
Okay, um, so I will also look at the Snow Cipher, which is an ISO standard for stream cipher encryption, so it's like the most important stream cipher on this planet. And we have studied the cipher extensively. Um, and uh, well, the interesting thing it has is this addition modulo 2 to the power 32, such so a normal addition on a 32-bit CPU, okay? Which is the same as in the Russian ghost. Okay, so at that time we have discovered a way to algebraize this uh, relation in a certain um, uh, form of algebraic equations, um, which have two different versions, but it's a method to algebraize this, uh, this equation, and it's pretty simple. So it contributes to the fact that ghost, the Russian ghost is not that hard to break. Okay, uh, also with, when we have been studying SNOW 2.0, we have discovered um, um, another sort of higher level attack, which um, I will briefly discuss. Um, the idea is that if we fix some well-chosen bits inside SNOW, we want to determine the other. So the main idea is that this process itself is a combinatorial optimization problem on which we need to work a lot. It's a, it's a very special task. Okay? And well, there is a method, which again almost comes out of no, nowhere by magic, to fix this thing to zero for nine consecutive steps, and then uh, out of n equations that you have added as an attacker, because you have assumed that this is zero for nine consecutive steps, Okay, so maybe it's not true at one place inside the encryption, but you can assume this to be true at another moment during the encryption. So actually it always uh, happens to be true at certain moment. Okay, so once you have added this N equation, so it's like putting N rabbits into your hat, you will be able to take out exactly four times N rabbits out of your hat. So again, we get an amplification. And the combinatorial optimization problem in, in, in the cipher would be how to optimize this. So to have the initial number of rabbits as small as possible and the final number of rabbits as high as possible. So again, a combinatorial optimization problem. And we have been doing um, um, uh, this many times for the Russian ghost in various ways. Okay, so now we look at the Russian ghost. So even today, it's still the official encryption standard of Russian Federation. Uh, it was developed in the 70s, uh, a former top secret algorithm declassified in the 90s. Um, it is, however, not true to compare GOS to DES, okay? Because DES uh, could not and should not be used in uh, um, um, confidential applications. It was just a commercial standard. Okay? It never was approved for um, uh, secret or top secret information. Okay? Um, uh, in contrast to, uh, to, uh, to the ES, GHOST has a very long key of 256 bits. So it really is a military grade cipher. Okay? Uh, in theory, the Moore's law will tell you it would be secure maybe for up to one, 200 years. Okay, so it's not a commercial algorithm for short-term security as DES was. It's widely implemented in use, Crypto++, OpenSSL, RSA Labs, uh, Central Bank of Russia, other very large Russian banks, uh, such as Sberbank, which is the, the largest bank in the Eastern Europe, etc. So it's not the equivalent of DES, it's something slightly different. Okay, so the Ghost has eight secret S boxes, Okay, and again, you may expect that many different of, uh, ver versions of GHOST will be used in different places, in different applications. So our attacks assume these S-boxes to be known. Okay, um, uh, if they are not known, there are actually already two already published papers about how to extract them from a chip. Okay. Um, so um, in terms of cryptanalysis, there was a lot of publications on GHOST. Uh, by many uh, well-known people, and until 2011, nobody found an attack on Ghost. And some people have even written a lot of things about it, like, after a considerable amount of time and effort, no progress in cryptanalysis of Ghost was made in the open literature. And, uh, um, in 2010, it was summarized in a paper despite considerable cryptanalytic effort spent in the, in the past 20 years, Ghost is still not broken written in 2010, or published in, in this year. 
Uh, in addition, people have discovered something truly interesting. Gauss actually is the best cipher we have ever known. Okay? If you look at the implementation cost, so the cost cost about 800 gate, gate equivalent. So only about 800 NAND gates. AES with a twice shorter key requires at least 3,000. DES, the old standard, required already about 4,000 minimum. Present, which is the new ISO standard um, um, of German or, uh, kind of German origin, um, still 2,000. And present is an exceptionally um, um, uh, uh, low-cost cipher compared to any other. But GOS still beats even present. Okay? So even today, and even with all these attacks that I'm going to tell you about, GOS is still the best cipher we know. <laughs> okay? Interestingly. Okay, so uh, for these reasons, not broken, and extremely good for uh, um, the hardware implementation, it was submitted to ISO to become an international standard in 2010. Less than 10 crypto algorithms were ever standardized by ISO. By ISO. So you have AES, NO, and PRESENT, for example. Um, so in the meantime, GOST was broken. So in every 2001, uh, 2011, just two attacks were published. One by ISO Bay at uh, 2000, FSC 2011, and one by myself. Um, so by the way, we have also submitted a report about GOST to, the, to ISO. And um, the report says that to standardize GOS would be really dangerous and irresponsible. And um, let me explain why um, I say such things. So um, to summarize the security of GOS today, we can say that it's half broken in very serious sense, and it's really broken in academic sense. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, some details. So here is a short history of existing attacks on Ghost. It's a bit complicated, so we can skip it. But you can see that since the, the, the first paper which was published, uh, the things have been sliding down and down in various ways. Okay? There are two main categories in attacks on Ghost. Single key attacks and multiple key attacks. Okay? But multiple key attacks, if you remember the talk uh, from, uh, I think it was yesterday, about RSA, how it gets broken in practice in SSL servers. Well, you understand that RSA is much less secure in the multiple key scenario than it is in the single key scenario. Okay? But it's also uh, true in general in cryptography for almost any cipher. Okay? So if you use a cipher with multiple keys, even if all of these keys are individually generated at random, and even if the random number generator is perfectly okay, which is what we assume in our attacks, even in this case, it's much less secure in multiple key scenario than in a single key scenario. Okay, so it's not true that the main, uh, uh, the main uh, result about the security of a cipher is the single key attack. This is, this, is, uh, this, is a, this is a fallacy because ciphers are almost never used with single keys in the real life. They are used with multiple random keys. And the security with multiple random keys is always uh, is a sort of meta theorem without a proof, will always be smaller, better, uh, than, um, or worse than uh, in, the, in the single key scenario. So there is a lot of interesting attacks um, going down to 2 power 101, which is the most recent result from December this year. Um, so, well, there is a lot of um, attacks and they apply an amazing range of known um, principles in symmetric cryptanalysis. So let us review all the reasons why GHOST is broken. Okay? It's not broken for just one single reason. Okay? So uh, um, uh, the attacks which have been published on GHOST by um, um, uh, uh, other researchers who have worked on this topic were always fixed point attacks or reflection attacks. Okay? But actually, I have developed many other attacks which are known of these and which use very different principles. Okay? So there is a, um, um, an amazing variety of different attacks on, on GHOST, which all break GHOST in the academic sense. 
Okay? So uh, the main reasons why Ghost is, um, is not very secure, uh, uh, there are actually two main reasons. So the first, you have the weak key scheduling, which actually um, is also a form of self-similarity in which uh, basically you have the first eight rounds and the next eight rounds is the same block, like in Keylock. And then you have poor diffusion. And this poor diffusion, so it's, if it's like flipping one bit, and then even after eight rounds, you don't achieve a full diffusion. Okay, so even after eight rounds of ghost, you will have uh, some uh, major irregularities. Okay, so, um, um, so the poor diffusion allows one to work at the low level. So actually the low level attacks are depicted here on this uh, part of the slide. Okay, so the, the low level attacks allow the attacker, as for DES, to break ghost for let's say eight rounds. Okay, so at the low level, um, um, the most recent attacks are a combination of a few things. So the amazing thing is actually we apply all these attacks in one single attack. So the attacks which apply all these things in one attack. Uh, so we apply algebraic approach with uh, algebraic co coding and SAT solver is one of the steps of these attacks. Uh, we apply multiple random keys which again gives a lot of uh, extra power to the attacker. Uh, we apply the mid in the middle approach and actually we apply also the um, uh, two and three and four dimensional and even six dim dimensional uh, mid in the middle approach. Um, we apply differential cryptanalysis um, in the form of truncated differential attacks which are actually an advanced form of differential cryptanalysis. And we also um, have developed differential attacks with multiple points uh, which are a form of higher order differential cryptanalysis. And all these things get combined in one single attack. And in order to find these things, such as what are the good truncated differentials that should, we should use, we have a lot of combinatorial optimization problems at the low level, so for, for, for say up to eight rounds. So we have problems such as what is the um, optimal set of bits that you need to fix, okay, like if you fix 60 bits and you determine all the other, but what is the optimal set of 60? Okay, so it's in terms of rabbits, it's like you put 60 rabbits in your hat and then you take out 256 rabbits, which is the whole key. Okay, so we have a lot of interesting combinatorial optimization problems, which are NP hard problems and which we solve by software and also by hand. Okay, so this is the lower, low level work. The low level work allows one to break up to eight rounds of ghost. Okay, and then at the high level, we have this umbrella uh, paradigm of algebraic complexity reduction which stems from self-similarity properties of ghost. And there is a number of distinct principles. We apply, uh, we have reflection attacks. Uh, we also have attack with double reflection, triple reflection, quadruple reflection. Uh, we have several advanced slide attacks. We have several fixed point attacks. And we also have involution attacks. So involution attacks, they use the property that certain permutations are involutions. Okay, evolution means that if X gets mapped to Y, Y is also automatically mapped to X. Okay, so we combine all these things to find advanced attacks on the ghost, um, best of which is uh, currently to power 101. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit uh, um, about details. So this umbrella idea of algebraic complexity reduction, it has many different incarnations. So the definition informally, is that we are looking for methods for uh, substantially reducing the size and the complexity of algebraic equations generating during the cryptanalysis of ghost. So it's a very rich, rich galaxy of attacks to be studied in the next 20 years. And it can be seen as a form of conditional algebraic cryptanalysis as well. Uh, it's, uh, it's like putting this rabbit into, uh, into the heart in some uh, or somewhat optimized way. Okay. Um, Additionally, because actually we will we'll be uh, obtaining attacks on just exactly eight rounds of ghost, we have something which is called black box, redu black box reduction. So whatever is inside this black box being eight rounds of ghost, okay, we have a reduction. Like if you have this data for 32 rounds of ghost for the full ghost, then automatically obtain some data for the eight rounds of ghost. Okay, so um, uh, almost all attacks are of this type. Okay, so they are black spot attacks in the sense they work whatever is inside. 
But then in the second step, when you try to break this eight rounds of ghost with low data complexity, like, you know, you just known three or four pairs for this eight rounds of ghost, well, you need to know what is inside in the second stage. Okay? But in a certain sense, uh, um, we see here a cryptanalysis coming to a maturity uh, and calling for specialization. So um, some researchers could just for their whole life study these reductions. Okay? We have found like 40 different methods of doing this already. And just do it in a black box way. And another, um, a, a, another cryptanalyst will be studying the problem of breaking eight rounds of ghost. And then the two components can be connected together to obtain a working attack on a full ghost cipher. Okay, so we have a, a, a nice split in two independent tasks for the cryptanalysis. So how these reductions they look like? They all have the following form. Uh, given some uh, 2 to the power x non-plain text for the uh, full 32 round ghost, obtain y non-plain text for 8 rounds of ghost. This is valid with probability 2 to the power minus z. So this is the initial cost. This is like the initial rabbits you are putting into the hut. And this will be true for a certain proportion of ghost keys, which is almost never one. Okay, so, it's, uh, so we have a four-dimensional space, and um, I have developed some 40 different methods of doing this for a variety of um, values for x, y, z, and t. Uh, so uh, here is one example. Given to the power 32 known plain text for the full 32 rounds uh, ghost, we obtain four known plain text for eight rounds of ghost. And this is valid with probability 2 to, the power one, um, 2 to the power minus 128. Okay? So in a certain sense, this is like two rabbits. So let's assume that one rabbit is 64 bits because this is the block size of ghost. So this is like two rabbits initially paid and then you obtain like four rabbits because you get four pairs uh, for uh, the eight rounds of ghost. Okay, so it's pretty good. Um, so, um, so uh, uh, there are many ways of doing this, and they are, it's always uh, some connection with some already known attacks, such as uh, slide attacks, fixed point attacks, cycling attacks, involution attacks, and other um, guess, guess the determine algebraic and other attacks. Okay, so it's an umbrella paradigm to unite all these attacks under one single formulation. Um, interestingly, all these attacks have been known before. But the, the reason why ghost was not broken before is that even if, even if this method of putting some rabbits into your hat and getting some more rabbits out of it could have been uh, conceived before, people did not really have an idea that there would be a second step for this type of attack. Because only in the last five years it became practically feasible to get a software a step or other sort of attack that would solve this at the end. So for example, to recover the key of uh, eight rounds of ghost. Okay, so the problem of breaking, and even today, so this is actually my last slide, so I will not show, show it right now. Even today, uh, July 2012, in a conference in Russia holding English, um, um, maybe we can actually um, go to this slide right now, but it's not very easy, I will try. Um, um, Russian researchers have very seriously claimed that none of these attacks work, and this is all fiction. Okay, so the fact that you can break eight rounds of ghost is, uh, strangely enough, still, that, uh, still uh, being um, uh, debated or doubted, uh, which is very interesting because, for example, for two known plain text, the attack is extremely simple, can be done by, by anybody in this room. So you just go on go Google Crypto Minisat, download Crypto Minisat. Then you just describe ghost in the most standard way you can think of as a SAT problem, and any way will, will work for you, and it will just break, and the software will just recover the key for you in seconds. Okay? But still, for some reason, Russian researchers still claim that it does not work and it's fiction. Okay? So it's quite interesting. I think, uh, I think I'm not going to display the slide right now. Okay, um, so, um, so this was the missing step to basically uh, even invent, even conceive this sort of attack. Okay, because uh, uh, this last step was not clear if it could be done. Okay, and if, if the last step is not, then attack actually does not exist. There's no attack if there's no last step. Okay, um, so let me now explain um, uh, the um, mathematical formalization in which most of these high-level attacks are done. 
Okay? So uh, at Indo Crypto 2008, Kara has described Ghost as this uh, equation. And actually, to, uh, to find all these attacks, you don't need to know anything else than this single equation. So everything is derived formally from this single equation. Okay? So basically, Ghost can be seen as a composition of a certain permutation E or Epsilon, actually we call it E, which is actually exactly the first eight rounds of Ghost, which is composed three times with itself. Then you have a swap. So the swap is basically I have two halves of 32 bits, you just exchange them. Okay? And then you have a decryption function, which is the exact equivalent of this encryption function. So it's basically like decrypting this backwards, however, after the swap, which also is the last eight rounds of Ghost. Okay? So, um, so this is a very interesting representation of Ghost, which leads to all these attacks. And this is due to the key schedule in Ghost, because if you look at this key schedule, you have keys from K0 to K7, again K0 to K7, K0 to K7, and then they go backwards from K7 to K0. Okay, and then this implies this, um, uh, this form of representation. Okay, this is quite interesting and also has some relation to um, uh, traditional historical cryptanalysis. Okay, so uh, maybe you have heard about something which some mathematicians have called the theorem which won the World War II. Okay, so um, this is a very simple theorem which was first uh, used by Rayevsky is that when P is a certain permutation, and then you have so-called co conjugated permutation, which is Q composed with P composed with the inverse of Q, uh, which is a situation which occurs very frequently in uh, traditional uh, rotor machine uh, cryptography. Well, these two permutations, they have the same cycle structure, uh, which implies a lot of things, actually. Okay, so for example, they have the same number of cycles of length three and for any other length, etc., etc., and many other properties. Okay, so this actually occurs in the last 16 rounds of Ghost. Because if you look at it, you have encryption, then you have the swap, and you have decryption. So, so you have Q is basically this, and Q minus one is basically this. And here we have a very simple thing, which is the swap. Okay, so this theorem can be applied to the last 16 rounds of Ghost. Okay, so what is the consequence of this? Is that this, the last 16 rounds of Ghost, it has exactly, not more than, not less, to the power 32 fixed points, so which are points of order one, and also it has exactly this number of points of order two. Okay, uh, but um, uh, what really in, will interest us for now is that it has a lot of fixed points. In a certain sense, it's like if you have a lot of fixed points, it's like you can see through something. Okay, because like with high probability, actually the input is going to be equal to the output. Okay, so it's like a semi-transparent cylinder. <laughs> okay, so this is quite interesting. And it's used in a lot of uh, attacks on Ghost, about half of attacks which have been found. Okay, um, um, so, uh, Another important um, property which needs to be studied is amplification again, okay? So how many more rabbits I can get out of my hat? Um, so the amplification, whatever is the definition, is really the ratio between the rabbits obtained and the, the rabbits that you have put in. Uh, and in slide attacks it was unlimited. Uh, we have found some very interesting attacks on Ghost which, in which the amplification is very, very high. Okay, so uh, in one attack, it's, it's very large and it leads to a, a, a quite efficient attack on Ghost. However, you need to look at the whole picture. In this particular attack, the, the additional cost factors which make that this attack is not as good as you, you might hope, but amplification is very high. It's like 200 or something like this. Um, so let's just look at the one example of an attack. So um, this one is about relaxing the requirements of a, sl a sliding attack, which you have seen for keylog. It was already relaxed for keylog, but we need to work more. Okay, so this was published in Cryptologia in 2012.
So if you look just to one ghost encryption, so you have this structure, you encrypt, 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 so this is the same permutation. Then you have this swap, which is also uh, on the pictures described by this, this symbol, so this is just the, the swap of two halves. And if this value is called D, this value is called D bar, basically, because it's the D swapped. Okay, so this notation means that we swap the, the two halves of 32 bits each. And then we get some value at the output. Okay, so we get this sort of picture with something interesting happens here, and there is some symmetry here. So now, if we consider sliding attacks, so it will be like two encryptions with a slide. In classical sliding attacks, the attacker is trying to equal all the values. Like B here will be B, uh, equal to B here, C here will be equal to C here, etc. And this is what allows him to basically infer things. Okay? However, in our advanced sliding attacks, you don't have to do that anymore. Okay? We actually are going to make things equal by additional assumptions, which are, needs also to be optimized to be not very costly, but it is possible to make imperfect sliding attacks in which certain things are not true in general, but they are true with some probability. Okay? And this is good enough for working attacks. Uh, so then, um, um, in general, this is achieved also through well-chosen assumptions on this data. Okay, so you make some sort of magical assumption. For example, in one attack, we assume actually that if you take this whole encryption to, the, um, uh, to here, and this value is called D, so you assume that this value D has this special property. The encryption of D is equal to D bar, actually. Okay, so it's a strange assumption. But if you think about it, actually, it leads to an attack in which you obtain also D here, and you obtain C here, and this C is uh, the same as here. So actually, you are able to basically relate all these values inside both encryptions. So it's in, in a kind of chemistry uh, analogy, it's like dissolving a solid. So we have uh, this solid cipher, we cannot see what's inside this, between these blocks, and we are able to break it into pieces because now we know all the values A, B, C, and D and it's inside. So we have been able to dissolve this cipher into smaller pieces of age rounds. Okay, that's the, that's the purpose of this sort of attack. And there are many, many different ways of doing it. And the question is, what is the best way? So it's a combinatorial optimization question. Okay, so anyway, in this case, we obtain a, a, an attack in which we can break a ghost faster than brute force. So I will skip the exact details. Um, the last step, actually, in this case, takes to 110 uh, ghost computations. And then, if you put all the figures together, you obtain an attack which is just slightly faster than brute force. Actually, it's 2 17 times faster than brute force. And this is not yet the best attack, but it's one of the attacks. It's one of the early attacks. Um, so this was published in Cryptologia in 2012. Um, and since then, many, many more attacks have been developed. So first of all, there is a lot, a lot more single key attacks. So um, some of them are summarized in this table. So actually, currently, the fastest single key attack obtained by this method is the complexity is 2 power 191 which is just, uh, can be seen as a slight improvement of an attack uh, uh, presented by Duncan Maldi, Dinov, and Shamir at FSC 2012. Um, so this is the fastest single key attack to be obtained by this method. But there is many other, and some of them are also interesting because they, even though they, the complexity is higher, they require less data. Okay? So it's very difficult to compare all these attacks, and the comparison metric is not obvious. It's not obvious to know which attack is the best. Okay. Uh, so, by the way, the paper which has contained this, this attack was submitted to Asia Crypto 2011, and one referee of this paper wrote the following thing. I think that the audiences of Asia Crypto will not feel it is interesting. Okay, and I look at the paper which were accepted at this Asia Crypt, and more than half of papers are um, about things which were nobody have ever heard about, not even professional cryptologists. So anybody have heard of GH42 cipher? Which is obviously nobody have ever heard of and was never ever used in practice. What about Armadillo cipher? Anybody have heard about Armadillo cipher? Okay, uh, so there's a lot of fear of it, Asia Crypt incremental research, things which interest um, mostly the, um, the author of the paper, uh, not to say it would interest anybody in the government or in the industry circles. So uh, not many standardization proposals, etc. 
So um, I will ask the following questions. How many times it happened in Asia Crip that a military grade cipher and, and an official government standard in exercise of a major country used by large banks implemented in SSL was broken while being in the process of being standard by, by ISO to become a global industrial standard? Okay? It has never happened. <laughs> okay? Um, so, quite interesting. <laughs> Neither at Eurocrypt and no at crypto, and, and neither at crypto. Yes, a few more minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, however, this is all academic research, obviously. Okay. Everybody is defending their research, and um, the fact is that nothing bad happened. It's just some bad press. Okay. Is Ghost really broken? Actually, not sure it ever it ever was broken. So let me explain this. Uh, well, is Ghost really so bad? Uh, when it was submitted to ISO and only then uh, suddenly some cryptanalysts tried to break it and succeeded because they have not tried before. So there is now more than 50 attacks, you have all these academic attacks. But uh, the fact is that we in the West have this paranoid idea about cryptography, super paranoid. Super high requirements for security of ciphers. It is actually debatable or probably not true that the Russian designers of Ghost ever thought it should resist attacks with complexity, uh, let's say, less than 2 to the power 256. And remember that Ghost also have a secondary key, secret S-boxes, which um, uh, brings the key size up to, let's say, more than 600, 600 bits. Um, and moreover, uh, even if you look at the best attacks which have been found, still even today, Ghost uh, is better than any comparable cipher in the terms of the ratio between the best attack and the implementation cost. There is no cipher in the West uh, which is as good as Ghost, even uh, with all these attacks. Um, so it's quite interesting, um, uh, obviously, the views on a given uh, technology. Uh, there, was, uh, the, the, there was a talk here at this conference about uh, uh, standard wars, you know. It always depends on the, uh, where you sit and who is talking. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have a few more minutes, so uh, there is a couple of other attacks. Uh, so we have simple reflection attack, you have double reflection attack, we'll skip the details. There is a lot of different versions. Actually, the best single key attack appears in a different paper, which was published in March 2012. It's this paper. Um, and the complexity of the best single attack is 2 per 179, so it's still quite high. But again, it's totally ridiculous to consider that the single key attack is the right measure of security of a cipher. Okay? Again, ciphers are never used with single keys in the real life. They are used with multiple random keys. So this is what we need to study if we really want to understand the security of a cipher. So in, so in this sense, the security of Ghost was never studied until some recent work, uh, works came out. So um, I claim that the multiple key scenario is stronger, more versatile and more practical than any single uh, uh, key, uh, known key attack. So actually this is a scenario which can be executed in the real life by a large intelligence agency, at least in theory, at least if you are able to have the data for this attack. Um, so there is a number of attacks, like you have triple reflection attacks, so here is one example. Um, Quite interestingly, um, um, until December 2012, we really had two distinct families of attacks. So we had all these attacks with complexity reduction, with a lot of work on the reduction itself, and a lot of work on the last step, so which, uh, which takes uh, like 150 pages of text. And then the another paper about differential cryptanalysis of Ghost. But there was no relation whatsoever between the two families of attacks. Well, actually, in December 2012, I have realized a method to connect all these things in one single attack, and this gives um, um, uh, birth to another uh, 20 very powerful recent attacks on, on Ghost. So it's a combination of differential attacks, higher order differential attacks, and all the things which we have already mentioned. Um, so uh, here is one example. With total data of 2 to the power 84, you obtain an attack with total cost of 2 to the power 139 to break one key. Okay? And interestingly, this time complexity can be even lower if you are allowed even more data. 
okay? But this data comes from many different devices. Okay, so it's like you have many different smart cards and you need to obtain some data for each of these smart cards. And most, da most data are not used in the attack, but they are needed to reject basically cases in which the attack does not work. So they are still needed, but they are not used by the core of the attack. Um, so if you go further, um, so this attack is a self-similarity attack in which in addition we assume some differences. So it's a really a combination of differential and uh, complexity reduction methods. Um, even more powerful attacks are obtained with multiple points. Differential cryptanalysis, you only have two points. Okay? Um, so more powerful attacks are obtained with multiple points. So multiple points, they look like this. You have four different points, and you have their corresponding encryption. So for example, C prime is the encryption of C. So we have eight points total, and then, uh, the interesting property of GOS is that there is a um, substantial probability that all these eight points will share some 50 bits. So they are kind of all related, okay, for a large number of points. So this is very surprising, needs to be shown. And uh, this leads to very powerful attacks because in the, in the past we have been guessing uh, things about this. So, for example, if I wanted to put just one rabbit into my hat, I would say, okay, let's assume mm, that A is equal to B or A is equal to B bar or something like this. So, my assumptions, okay? But now because I have managed to shrink the space from 64 bits to 14 bits, it's much smaller because 50 bits are shared for all these eight values, the cost of any assumption I like is now much, much lower. So it's a very powerful generic method for redeveloping all the same attacks from the beginning, okay, but now the cost of anything I want is much lower. Okay, so there is, a many, there is many new attacks following this, uh, these lines with two, three, and four points. And it's also a form of advanced higher order differential attack. Um, so, um, so these are the recent attacks. The best of these recent attacks, is the complexity is actually 2 to the power 101. So it is somewhat nearly first feasible for a large intelligence agency to execute, and further improvements in these attacks are expected. In terms of the data needed, it's, uh, it's very theoretical, but in terms of practical feasibility, the answer is yes, it is feasible to execute uh, in practice this sort of attack. So this is basically it, and I will just, uh, so here's a summary of these recent attacks, so there is a lot of results, so it's pretty boring to really um, uh, recall them. And now I will show uh, what the Russian researchers have written as uh, um, very recently, July 2012. Okay, so the attacks on eight rounds are not facts, they are fictions. Okay, but this one you can do with Crypto Minisat. This one is more technical, it will be published in Cryptology in January 2013. Um, and also, they say that for differential attacks, uh, good S boxes would make these attacks fail. Okay? But this is a super naive statement. Okay? Because it makes very little sense to take our differential attack, which was designed for one version of the cipher, and apply it to another version of the cipher and say, look, it doesn't work. Okay? These attacks need to be optimized separately for each version of the cipher. Okay, so you need to find another differential property for the next version and re-optimize it again and then you can see, maybe it works, maybe it fails, I don't know. But it's very, very naive to claim uh, just, uh, you know, uh, what, they, what they claim. This is all that I wanted to say. Uh, like, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> There is no more time left for questions, but if you have questions, I guess, do you have a few minutes for questions, like after the talk, official talk? Yes, yes, I can uh, take all so the questions. So, just <laughs> approach the tribune. Okay, let's, speak, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, thank you.